All right, good afternoon, biology students. Um, hopefully my video goes okay. I've been having a few issues. I must have some setting wrong and I keep, I don't know, something keeps messing up. So hopefully uh, you're able to hear this whole thing. And if not, uh, I might need to learn some stuff from you guys when I get back. And speaking of that, I will be back on Friday. I am, uh, I tested negative for COVID-19. So, uh, that, that was good. And just finishing out my 14 day quarantine because that is the rule. So Friday, I'm excited to be back, um, and kind of get caught up to speed with you guys. So, okay. The other day you guys watched a video called how stuff works water. And today we're going to be investigating just that water. Okay. And, and you might say, you know, how exciting can water be? Um, totally get where you're coming from there. Um, but this is probably one of the best sections for us to connect physics, science and biology. And uh, we do that by talking about water. So um, something I thought of here last night, water is both good and bad, but often it's forgotten. Um, and that, that can be good or bad too. So uh, a good thing about water, we need it for life. It's a uh, it's necessary for us to drink. A bad thing about water, if you've ever had water in your basement or um, ruined something because it got wet or even, uh, you know, it taken water into your lungs, those things can be really bad. Um, but we often, you know, don't go through our lives worrying about our water. We are, we are fortunate enough to, you know, to be able to put our water bottle under the fountain or turn on the sink and, and uh, expect, expect it to come out. But, you know, maybe a time in your life that wasn't available and you really, really crave some water. So uh, we take it for granted. Um, other facts about water. You know, we look at the Earth's surface and three quarters of that surface is roughly water. But I think it's 71% or 75%. So quite a bit of that uh, showing up on our maps and globes and views of the Earth. Your body is 60% water. So is it any wonder when you are dehydrated um, or how easy it is to become dehydrated, your body functions can start to uh, suffer? Another really interesting thing about water, and we could spend a lot of time on this, is the density and freezing oddity. Okay, And if you recall density from physical science, density is a measure of your mass divided by your volume. Another way of thinking about that is kind of like thinking about how much something weighs, which is determined by its mass, and then how much space it takes up. And we cram more stuff into a smaller space, that's a denser object, right? Like a hockey puck is more dense than a Nerf ball. So normally when items are heated, when substances are heated, we increase the temperature, we increase the speed of the particles, and most substances expand. That's how a thermometer works. The expansion of the substance in the tube helps us un understand what temperature we're looking at or what speed those molecules are moving. So uh, water is the opposite. When it cools, it actually expands, so to speak. And when it's heated, it takes up less space. Okay. We call these processes, of course, you know, melting and freezing points. Um, so it does it pretty much different than most other substances. And that is odd, but it is also um, crucial for having life on, on earth and sustaining that life with uh, varying climates and seasons. And so we'll look at that here coming up. I got a couple diagrams that'll help shed light on that. And another interesting thing is very few compounds are found as liquids at, at normal room temp or in nature. Most compounds are solids or gases. Well, water, uh, we know can also be a gas, steam, um, or water vapor in the air. And it can also be solid as ice, but um, at a constant room temperature, it is, it is liquid. 
All right, so here we have a diagram that shows us that water is polar, meaning that it, and you saw this in the video, hopefully, that water has a slightly negative side to its molecule and a slightly positive side. And how that comes to be is due to the fact that uh, the sharing of the electrons, remember this is covalent bonding, sharing electrons between a hydrogen and a oxygen, those electrons are shared unevenly. And so we get a little more negative charges hanging out over here compared to over here, even though these are all going around here. And so we get a negative and a positive side. Okay. You might say, well, big deal. What, why does that matter? Um, it matters quite a bit when we start looking at more than one water, water molecule. And anytime you look at water, you're looking at more than one water molecule because you couldn't see just one. So you take a drink of water, for instance, you're, you're taking in you know, trillions of molecules of water. Uh, and so there's two types of bonds going on. Covalent, which holds the individual molecule together, sharing electrons between two non-metallic atoms. And then a hydrogen bond, which holds one water molecule to the to another water molecule okay and they show this um, pretty cleverly by showing a nice filled in line for the covalent bond and a broken up line for the hydrogen and that's a great reminder to us that hydrogen bonds are weaker than covalent and so it would be easier to detach one water molecule from another than it would be to obviously detach the hydrogen from the oxygen in the water. Okay. So what does all this mean? Okay. Well, these features, uh, how the water bonds together and the way it's arranged contributes to all these interesting things about water. So let's look at those things. First one is called cohesion and cohesion is just uh, the attraction of molecules of the same substances to each other. Okay, so we have, uh, in our case, we're talking water. So we have water molecules and they are attracted to other water molecules and that is called cohesion. And so in the background picture here, we see a, uh, a surface with um, maybe after a rainfall and we have water kind of pooling up in I don't know if you call it groups, droplets. Um, notice it's not an even dis um, an even distribution of the water. It's obviously the water is attracting or adhering or excuse me, uh, attracting to each other. Okay. I probably confused you more than you should be. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, here we have a water strider. This, this is an insect that actually uh, um, skims across the surface of the water. I, I think there's some in existence that do this their entire life. They never leave the water. Uh, but anyway, how does it do that? Well, we have cohesion. The water molecules are attracted very tightly to one another, um, which creates what we call a surface tension and allows the insect to do that. Some of you guys in your student um, information form referenced last year's lab of balancing pennies or floating pennies on a piece of tin foil in the water. Same concept. Okay, so you guys have looked at that before. All right, there's also something called adhesion. And this is where I used, I used the, weird, uh, the word adhere in the previous slide. Shouldn't have done that because um, it causes some confusion. Anyway, adhesion, okay. This is the attraction between molecules of different substances. So here on the right, we have a graduated cylinder and you guys learned to read that last year. And remember, uh, we would, you know, expect the water to be nice and level because we, that's what we know about water. But um, when we read one of these objects, what happens is there's a stronger pull basically between the water molecule being attracted to the glass than there is water to water. And so we get uh, water at these edges attracted to the, um, the glass molecules and we get that meniscus shape. Okay. 
that's physical science example. In biology, uh, we look at a, at a tree here. Okay, so here it looks to be a very tall and old tree. Um, trees need water, right? And where do they get their water? Ultimately from where? The ground, right? It rains or groundwater is taken up through the roots and that water needs to get up into the tops of the trees, into the fibers, the tissues, the, the structures. Um, and how it does that is through what's called capillary action, which is a series of little tubes in the, in the cell uh, tissues of the, of the plant. And the water is drawn up those through adhesion. So pretty cool. If you ever wondered how plants do that and how they get so big, that's part of it. Okay. Heat capacity is another one. And um, the basis here is that because of the way water is put together and behaves, it takes a large amount of heat to make water molecules move faster. Okay. And we mentioned earlier, moving faster means higher temps. Okay. And so it is very possible in your life you have jumped into a lake such as this guy here diving into a lake and been surprised by the water's temperature okay maybe it was colder than you thought maybe it was warmer than you thought and the reason being because of that heat capacity uh water changes rather slowly in comparison to like air temperature which can change very quickly okay um, this is important for life. Put yourself in a fish's shoes or flippers. Sorry, hit the button there. Uh, put yourself in a fish's shoes or flippers or fins or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, think when our temperature changes drastically in the, in the fall, we go from some warm temps and all of a sudden it gets cold and snowy. And, um, if even, if any of you have ever had a fish from like Walmart and you put it in your fish tank and it died immediately because you you know, altered the temperature just slightly. Imagine what would happen if you did it um, way more than slightly, like dramatically. Uh, things wouldn't be able to make it. And so uh, the fact that water does change slow enables, you know, things to live in water all year or all their life. Okay. Uh, here's a woman ice fishing. So Ice fishing explains both this concept as well as density. Uh, the reason we're able to stand on, on the lake and fish is that water, as was mentioned before, lowers its density by taking up greater space when it freezes. And that's because due to the arrangement of those molecules, the hydrogens to the oxygens of different molecules, uh, the water expands okay you know ice ice uh, if you freeze a water bottle completely full it, it'll crack it potentially and so the ice actually becomes slightly less dense than the water around it and so the ice floats to the top and makes a nice ice layer if water did what other substances did and became um, um expand expanded as it was heated and contracted it as it was cooled the ice would sink and then you can see what would happen in north dakota we would have a complete um, block of ice as our lake and it would kill everything inside there so uh, really cool when you start looking at all these things water can do all right we mentioned water here and of course take note that water is rarely pure it's rarely you know, just H2O, we can purify it. But the water that we drink, the water that we see outside uh, in our clouds, in our lakes, on the, on the, on the street, in snowbanks, that's mixtures, okay? Where we have uh, a mixture is two or more elements or compounds that are physically mixed together, but not chemically combined, okay? And so the parts retain their properties and with, there are methods we should be able to separate the mixture, okay? By definition, mixtures can be separated. And so uh, we get two main types of aquatic or uh, water-containing mixtures. One is a solution, 
and the word homogeneous may ring a bell from last year. Homogeneous uh, means the same throughout. Okay. Uh, and often these substances do have a clearness to them. Doesn't mean they don't have a color, but they're very clear. We can see through them. Um, light passes very readily. And a solution is made of two parts, the solute and the solvent. Okay. And the solvent is, actually, I should do this in order here. The picture's not in the same order, but oh well. Okay. Solute is the dissolved substance. So it's the thing that basically is going to eventually disappear when we dissolve it. Okay. You throw some sugar in your water. You know, we can't see that, right? You so throw some salt in the water. You can't see that. You can't see the CO2 in there. You can't see the oxygen in there, but it's all in there. Okay. Um, the water is the substance that did the dissolving, and that's called the solvent. So, you know, salt water, for instance, water is the solvent. The salt is the solute. And we call it a solution of ocean water. Okay. So how does a dissolving work? Here's a diagram that kind of puts it in perspective for you. This is very similar to what you saw in the water video. And no, you don't have to know anion and cation, and you don't have to know all these things. That's, that's chemistry, and that's more than we care to know at this point. Um, but here's a substance getting dissolved. Notice it's made up of negative and positive particles. Okay, those could be uh, from an ionic bond, like in salt or something. And we have water molecules surrounding it. And what happens is those water molecules will kind of looks like they're taking those things away, right? They're stealing them away, right? Uh, we get an attraction between um, the positive and negatives. And notice, you know, we have a big clump of something, like a big chunk of salt. You can see it, right? We start making those things into smaller parts. Um, they're a lot tougher to see, right? And when they get too small, we can't see them. And that's how we get solutions. A suspension, on the other hand, is what we call heterogeneous, which means different throughout. And that means we have a, a little bit bigger particle, um, oftentimes very cloudy, um, tough to see through or, or light to penetrate through. Um, and eventually will separate depending on what it is. It might take a while. It might be fast, but it will separate. And so uh, this was a diagram I, I found. Um, I like that it says, you know, here's a solution. Okay, notice you can't see the parts to it. Here's a suspension. We can see things. We even see some settling here at the bottom. And then some more chemistry terms that I'm not really worried about you knowing, but the supernate and the precipitate, that's the name given to each part of a suspension. So you just need to know what the difference between a suspension and a solution. Okay. All right. If you can go and fill out the Google form called properties of water, that would be great. There are a few questions that involve a little bit of, a little bit of thinking and you may have to go back and watch this video and that's not a big deal. Uh, so go ahead, get that completed. And looking forward to seeing you guys on Friday or Monday, depending on your, your cohort. All right. Take care, and we'll see you soon.